Hello friends and gamers and welcome to the Fortress. My name is Jinx and today I want to talk about campaign medals for the Spring Offensive Tournament for Global War 1936. So what are the campaign medals? Well, the campaign medals is a series of ribbons that you attach to your chest at the end of the tournament. I have a representation here. It'll look like that. You attach it at the end of each tournament. Now those are a series of three ribbons attached like this. They slide onto a bar right there and you'll have a series of three for each tournament. Now next year you'll get another, another row and a third row, a fourth row as the years go by. What they represent, what the ribbons represent is the first is a campaign ribbon to show which tournament that is that you attended. The second one is a prestige ribbon to show your accomplishments within the game. And the third one is the national ribbon to show which nation you played. In this case, it's Japan. There's no prestige stars on this one. And this is a campaign ribbon for that year. You will attach, the, our Panzer King is going to arrange all the medals and all the ribbons for everybody. So we don't need to worry about that. But the campaign ribbon will have a number attachment. So for the first year, you'll have one. Second year, you'll have two, etc. as things go by. The prestige ribbon will have a series of stars on there to represent how well you did within the game. We'll get into that momentarily. And the last one will have a star attachment if you won second or third place. First place, sorry, first, second or third place. A first place you'll have a gold star, a second place you'll have a silver star if your alliance won second place overall. And if you're on third place, no star because we don't want to clutter this thing up too much with stars. It'll also potentially have an oak leaf. If I come in playing as Japan and just Japan, I won't have an oak leaf. But if I come in and my two German, uh, sorry, two, two allied play, uh, Axis players, the Italians and the Germans, call in sick. And then I say, look, don't worry guys, I'll tackle all of them, I'll play them all, then I'll get an oak leaf to represent that I have played three major powers in that game. I'll have Japan and an oak leaf. And so that's the way that works out. Now that works out too in the case of, say, Russia. You start off with no oak leaf, but if you evolve CCP to become a major power, oh, sorry, yeah, CCP, then you'll get a bronze oak leaf to represent that you have now two major powers at the end of the game. So you'll be able to tell at a glance how well you did within the game. If your alliance won, it'll have a gold or silver gold star. If you played more than one major power, it'll have an oak leaf. Your prestige ribbons will show kind of in-game accomplishments, and your campaign ribbons will simply show that you attended. Each year you'll gain another column, and so you'll be able to have build this reputation where they say, ah, you know, you're a formidable Japanese player because you've played Japan three years in a row, and each time the Axis have won first or second place. You'll be able to see that on this as well, and that will keep a running kind of reputation, your campaign history written on your chest. I intend on keeping track of everybody's thing as well too, so that we can keep track in years as they, as they go by who played what. I think that would be quite wise to do, keep it in a book or something like that. So that is the intention behind these things. Now let's talk about the prestige ribbon. So the prestige ribbon, the center one, will have a series of star attachments and the bronze star attachments. The idea behind that is sometimes you lose a game but sometimes within that game you lost, the one that you got third place, you actually did really, really well. That it was just, it was just right on the fringe, you would have probably won, but last minute you got sniped and somebody took off a bunch of victory points, but you would have, you were just that close, you're that close and you could have won, just like that. And, uh, but still, we want to recognize that. We want to recognize your accomplishments within the game, and so you'll have a certain amount of prestige that you've accumulated with the amount of prestige stars. Consider them as type of, of in-house victory points, but in-house victory points that are occurring and calculating at, you know, at all times during the game. So for instance, if Germany captures Stalingrad but ends up losing the game afterwards, that's worth a prestige point because you did something pretty, pretty brave, pretty, you know, you know, something worth doing in that game. Likewise, if London falls, you get a prestige point. If Japan ever conquers, say, a whole bunch of the islands on the Pacific Ocean, you get a prestige point. Now you might not want to do that, you might not want to conquer all the islands because it's out of your way and it's not your strategy, but if you do, you should be rewarded for that effort that you put into there. Likewise, if Italy jumps into the war and captures Eastern Egypt, even if it ends up losing the game, if it grabs Eastern Egypt, the Suez Canal, and holds it for a full turn, that's something worth recognizing, even if Italy ends up just being dogpiled and completely lost immediately afterwards, their accomplishments will be recognized in the game. So you look at your medal, you look at your ribbons and say, you attended this campaign, you actually did quite well despite the fact that you lost. And so in future years, you'll be able to see a person's reputation like, yeah, I mean, you're doing really, really well. So the way I'm trying to structure the prestige stars and, and schedule kind of what, how to get all of them is something like this. The first prestige star you'll have 
is pretty basic. You know, it's like almost everybody could get a prestige start because it's all pretty basic stuff. For example, some of them will be as Germany raid convoy lines in a single turn for eight bucks, or maybe it's ten bucks now. Eight bucks have taken off the allies or any enemy convoy line or any across all the convoy lines taken ten bucks off an enemy through convoy raiding. So that will get you one star. Another one might uh, uh, for stage one. Another one might be something like for the let's see for the. The Americans is a good one for the Americans is regain China. I'm oh, sorry, regain the Philippines. March back into Philippines and recapture it. That would be a prestige one star as well. In the earlier editions, I had it fairly simple, just a series of say six, and you could get you know if you score any one of those six, you can build up up to four stars. Now in the later editions of this, I actually have it more complex, where you have a tier system where. You have one, three options to get your one star. You have three options to get a, a second star, and three options to get fourth. And your fourth star only two options. And that's kind of what it is. And so you're not really roaded into going down certain pathways, and you can actually broaden your scope and have three different options within every tier to get that star. Now, if you happen to skip a star, say for instance you just find the tier two stuff too difficult, but you manage to get your one tier and your tier three star, it doesn't automatically mean that you fill in the center and have three stars. It means that you just have simply two on your prestige ribbon. That's the way that works out. Is you can't skip. You have to get score one within each tier. And some things too will be detrimental to your victory point as well. So for instance, you might want to. It might be something where you're just wasting some resources somewhere else. So for example, it could be something like USA build a railway between USA territory to to Alaska, the Alcan Highway. If you do that, yes, it might be beneficial, but it might not be beneficial, and you're just pouring money into something you might not use. But at the end of the day, it's your handicapping, putting an arm behind your back, and saying, "I'm going to win this with a handicap of the money I spent on the railway going up to Alaska. Eight bucks. I'm going to do it without those eight bucks and see if I could get that one star." That's the way of doing this. Some of them will be butting heads against each other. For instance, the Allies and the USA—they're both trying to capture and control Rome at the end of the game. Which is a historical kind of、uh, thing that they try to do, and that's for a tier two or tier three category. They both want to get to Rome, and it might be difficult for both of them to get to Rome. They might have to, you know, they might have to decide. Well, okay, you have it because I can go for this one instead, because that is since you have three different options. You know, USA might say, "Okay, take Rome. I'm going to go and grab this other tier over here instead." And there might be a little bit of animosity between two people. Other ones will go directly against each other. You know, for instance. Russia will have one where it has to hold on to five victory cities, one, two, three, sorry, four victory cities during the entire course of the game. Yeah, during the entire course of the game. So Novosibirsk, Stalingrad, Moscow, and Leningrad. At the end of every Russian turn, it has to hold on to four cities. If and the Germans have one where they have to grab Stalingrad. So you have Germans going straight for Stalingrad, boom, to try to get their victory city, and the Russians are saying, "No, we want to hold on to our four victories. Or we want to hold on to our four cities. We're not letting you having it. We're taking it back." And so we might see some head-to-head -head stuff for some of the higher tier difficulties. So for the tier three for the Russians, the tier three for the Germans, boom, go head-to-head -head in kind of a historical pathway. All these things are built with historical operations in mind, either ones that were. Planned and never executed, or some are very similar, just slightly tweaked, you know, with the name changes and that kind of thing. So you have certain things that just work directly across, and some of them not. So other ones are based on speeches by leaders. So for instance, there is one by the British that says, "We shall never surrender," which is any city territory they capture, barring Warsaw, Istanbul, and Hong Kong. They have to, if they grab onto it, if they end the previous turn with it, they have to hold onto it. And so that means Sydney. Calcutta, London, Tobruk. If they capture Tobruk from the Italians, they have to hold on to Tobruk until the end of the game. They just can't get away from it, and that's how you get the rats of Tobruk. You know, that's where they come into the historical picture as well. Any other cities that they capture as well, if they happen to capture Madrid, same thing. If they recapture Hong Kong, they have to hold on to it until the end of the game, and that's a fairly difficult one for them to grab onto as well. Historical as well, so they're all built around history. I've I've had Wikipedia page open, 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 trying to find all the details I possibly can. The late stage tier four stuff is all about expanding your empire and conquering that little bit more. So for Russia, grabbing a bunch of Europe, you know,、uh, bringing up to the Warsaw Pact lines, you know, grabbing Eastern Egypt, Berlin, Bohemia, you know, Hungary, perhaps Yugoslavia, just grabbing a whole bunch. 
Uh, for the Germans, it's something on the flip side with Lebensraum, grabbing a whole bunch of Russian territory. For the Americans, it's, it's stuff like bombing um, Japan to oblivion or something along those lines, right? Um, for the British, the British are trickier because they are trying to bring things back to the state they were prior to World War II, right? So they're a little bit trickier to arrange, but something along similar lines where they keep the German, sorry, keep the Soviets or keep the world from being dominated by Axis or the Russians at the end of the game. You get the picture kind of more grandiose perspectives of how things work. So tier one is fairly easy, but kind of inconvenient and oftentimes putting a hand behind your back and handicapping yourself by eight to 10 bucks somewhere there. The second tier is kind of more historical objectives. Sometimes it's grab onto this or hold on to this or do this thing. Um, tier three is more of the grandiose battle things like Stalingrad, um, battle against you know a bunch of battleships where you take or a bunch of capital ships where you take down more capital ships than they have of yours. Something along those lines. So they're all tiered in certain ways. And tier four is the more grandiose plans. So that's the way these things work with the tier system. It's all printed in a sheet like this where you have a campaign ribbon, prestige ribbon, national ribbon with a reminder of what each one is. You have your tier one with three different options, all named in German as well as English translation. You have in yellow, like the, the kind of easier medium stuff or medium easy, or I don't know what you want to call it, <laughs> the two star stuff. So here you have, for Germany, you have the happy time, the Atlantic wall, Operation Western exercise, conquering parts of Scandinavia. Tier two, you have German Africa Corps, having a German infantry vehicle and armor unit in um, Eastern Egypt. Then you have Operation Fire Magic, capturing Leningrad and War Plan Z, building a certain amount of ships. So you see all these things, kind of what you need to get. And you need to score one of them in each to get that tier objective. In the more tier three stuff, so the hard category, you have Operation Heron, which is capture Stalingrad and hold it for a full turn. Operation Sea Line, capture London and hold it for a full turn. And then lastly, as a soft, soft tier three, I almost call these ones, is something that leads up to tier four. You have a military administration of France and the game with all home country of France is controlled by Germany and all land zones with a German printed roundel. Not extraordinarily difficult to get this one if Germany is winning. I think, it's, uh, I think that one's not too difficult to get. And then in tier four, you have Lebensraum, where you've expanded your German empire by holding all Polish territory, all German territory, all Picardy, Belgium, Netherlands, and Denmark, Slovakia, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, you know, a whole bunch of territories, plus all of Russian territory, up to basically Stalingrad and controlling much of Moscow as well. And then down here, you have Great German Europe, which is more of a, east, a Western focus while holding all the neutrals, not touching Russian territory, but holding basically all the neutrals of Europe, including Spain and Portugal. That's essentially how this one works out. So you see, we have the <clears throat> tier structure and your goal is to score at least one in each. Now, sometimes you want more than one in each because at the end of the game, you might lose one uh, instead of the other one, right? So you might want to go for both of these just in case on the very last turn, somebody snipes you and take you away from one of them. I should also state that some of these ones that are about grabbing territory, there's always an exception. So in the case of Lebensraum, grabbing a bunch of territory, it's always grab all this territory, but five of them can be omitted. You know, you want to grab all five, but the reason that there's a five a mission on that is just in case on the last turn somebody grabs a couple of territories you still get your tier 4 victory that's the concept behind that and so that's how they work <clears throat> let's talk briefly a little bit about the history so Panzer King and I in 2019 he sent me some photographs of his Olympic medals I'd call them or his medallions for first second and third place and I was pretty excited about that but when I saw them uh, the the most valued player award I told him like man these things like these military style medals I was like these things look fantastic I mean there was a bigger version of this like one of those hanging up there there's a bigger version of this is like most valued player I was like that looks really cool that makes me want to go from like a you know a seven to a nine or a six to an eight something like that right I want to go to this tournament because I want to attend and from that uh, I was like what about this idea of having these campaign ribbons to keep uh, track of your reputation, to keep track of your campaigns that you attended, keep track of what you've accomplished within the game. And something that you can bring to the table each and every game, instead of having a medallion here, you know, uh, a, big, um, uh, a big ribbon around your neck that you feel kind of ostentatious and you droop over the table and it hangs out like that. Like, what about if we had something like this that you could pin on your chest? And as somebody that likes military history, and I'm sure much of you guys like it as well because you like World War 36, this really appealed to me and really made me want to go.
And it reminded me of the Axis and Allies forums with how you could get silhouettes. You, you know how you could donate to the Axis and Allies of forums and you could get a silhouette of a tank on your profile page. You know, you could get it right, not your profile page, but your, you know, the side of your, I don't know what they call it, but on the side of when you post something, your message board, on the side of your profile there, whatever it's called. You could get a silhouette of a tank in silver, gold, or bronze. That was really cool. And it people incentivized people to keep showing up, keep donating, keep donating, getting that streak of gold, 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 Churchill, gold tiger, gold, you know, uh, leopard tank, everything that there is out there. I can't name too many tanks. <laughs> but get those things just to show up, show up, show up. And so the idea here is as well, it's nice to be on the ground floor. It's nice to show up even on the second and third year and start building your streak and attending, attending and building this reputation because the world revolves around respect and being acknowledged for your, your existence on the world as well and your accomplishments and what you've achieved. I think that's important too. I think this is an, a way of honoring the players that show up to make that effort of showing up, to paying that, that fee to come in, to fly over, to drive over, to spend the hours in the weekend to show up and to come away with it with some sort of recognition for their service, not just if they won or lost, you know, with the gold or silver but with how well they did within the game and what nation they played as well. I think that's important to demonstrate as well because sometimes it's nice if you play Italy to be recognized that, hey, look, you got three or four stars out of playing Italy. That's fantastic because that's much harder than getting three or four stars as America. <laughs> that's the concept behind that. So <clears throat> that is a scoop. So what else could I add on this subject? It is important, I think, um, that everybody just have fun with it, right? It's not something that's supposed to be divisive. It's something that everyone's supposed to enjoy. And I definitely enjoy it as well. I think it's a lot of fun. Thank you all for watching. Cheers.